Page 187 of The Unfolding is Stories of Waiting for Love. God is a promise keeper and He is faithful. Now we've been married for over 30 years. That angel dream is still a sweet, sweet blessing, even though I had to wait 10 years for it to come to pass. God's story has been unfolding. Since the beginning of time. He invites you to be a part of it. (laughs) Another page in the unfolding. Hey, this is Meredith. So I've only heard God's voice one time in my life. And by that, I actually mean, I think it was God's voice. I think that's what I heard. It only happened the one time. In fact, it was only one word, one syllable. And almost right away, I started to second guess. Was that really God? It came in response to a question that I was asking God. Actually, it was more of a desperate plea. Lord, please, please just tell me, am I ever going to get married? When you long to love and to be loved by somebody, waiting can be so hard. Today, we're sharing stories about waiting for love. If you have been waiting and hoping and praying, or maybe somebody you love is waiting and hoping and praying, I think these stories will encourage you. I'm going to share my story with you later in the episode, but first we have two stories to share from Melody and Mary. Now, I interviewed Melody for our special Angel Stories episode this past December. Melody is a realtor, and she shared this story about getting her car stuck on railroad tracks as a train was barreling toward her. It is a crazy story that you will never forget when you hear it. So if you haven't heard it, go back and listen to our Angels episode from December. So after we recorded her story, we were talking and she said, in just kind of an offhand way, you know, if you ever want to hear a Valentine type story, I've got one for you. Well, I knew I wanted to hear it. (laughs) So we recorded it this past week. I think you're going to love hearing it too. Here's Melody. On the day that I was getting married the first time, I remember being in the church basement. I was all dressed. All my bridesmaids had gone. You know, I was just kind of there for a minute by myself. And I remember hearing God say, don't do it. (gasps) And I was 19 years old. I was You know, that would be like the most awful embarrassment for my family and friends, you know, for everybody. But I can remember, I've always remembered that, that I was never supposed to marry that man. Oh, wow. That's so hard. Had you had an inkling of that before you got to that point? You know, no, I was young and I just, you know, kind of ramrodded my life, you know, just like kids do. And uh, it just took that quiet moment for God to say, nope, you're not supposed to be doing this. And and I often wonder what my life would have been like if I had not done that. I mean, Mm -hmm. would I have met Mike in a different way earlier, you know? (laughs) Those are the questions we ask God when we get to heaven. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. That's right. So you married at 19 and you got into the marriage. Was it What was your faith like and your life like during that time? My faith, my faith was uh, good, but the man I married was not a Christian, really. You know, he might say he was a Christian just because he wasn't anything else. But, you know, it was like, oh, this doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that he, it you know, that he doesn't know God like I know him. You know, all those lies we tell ourselves when hormones are going and, you know, and youth is there. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I, my faith was good. I was going to church every Sunday, but I was going to church every Sunday by myself. And um, in those years, my father was my pastor. So I was going to our church, my family church with dad being the pastor. So my my faith was um it was there but it was kind of on a shelf. Yeah. And then as you went through the years of your marriage, obviously you you got married, were you Right. Were there times where you were hopeful that it was going to work or was it I was always hopeful it would work and uh and then he he was unfaithful. I didn't know that until after I got divorced. Friends, you know, said, well, we knew, but we didn't know how to tell you and, mm-hmm. and you know, those kinds of things. And mm-hmm. and uh, you can't be mad at your friends about that because you don't know how you would have taken it. Yeah. And so when it ended, what was your life and your faith like at that point? 
my I was still going to church. I was still I was still a believer. I was I just I guess I knew remember that voice, you know, that God voice that said don't do this and it's like man, I should have listened. I should have listened. I should have listened. Yeah. But but I was, you know, it was in the 80s, you know, it was kind of I was a young woman. I was uh, I had a good job. I I just I guess I didn't focus on God very much, but he was always there. Hmm. So now you're disappointed mm-hmm. and divorced and you end yeah. up moving back into your mom and dad's house. Yes. Yeah. Yes. As a divorced 25-year-old woman, I found myself living in my childhood bedroom at mom and dad's house. I was devastated and embarrassed. Nobody in my Christian family had ever been divorced. My parents and family surrounded me with love, but I was absolutely demoralized. Then one night, I had a powerful dream. I was told by an angel that April 18th would be the best day of my life. When I came into the office this next day, my supervisor even noticed something had changed in me. Can you, do you remember any details about the dream, like what you were doing or what the angel looked like or how, were you thinking about being lonely in the dream or how, just, did you have any idea what it was about? I, I, I think I went to bed just feeling beaten up and I don't remember anything about the dream other than the, the message that I got from it, that huh. April 18th would be the des- best day of my life. I don't remember seeing an angel. I don't remember. I don't, unfortunately, I don't remember any of that. But I don't even think it was memorable then, uh-huh. 40 years ago either. It was just, it was just the revelation that April 18th was going to be the best day of my life. And did you think that was going to be connected to your heart, your loneliness and your heart and wanting to be married? Or did you just know it was going to be special and you didn't know what it was about? I didn't know what it was about. I even kind of thought maybe this was going to be the day I die, (laughs) you know, but I was looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. Wow. And so you go into work the next day and your supervisor says, there's something different about you? Yeah. He says, wow, Mel, I don't know what happened to you, but, uh, and I and I think I told him, you know, 40 years later, I think I told him I had a dream last night. Hmm. But but he it was obvious that something had changed and he he made a comment to me. And <laughs> uh, so that was pretty, uh, pretty evident that I was wearing something different in my personality or in my in my face, in my body, uh-huh. in my whatever. <laughs> and you told, you did tell a handful of people about it. I did. I did. I, I know I told my parents. I know I told my sisters and I may have told a, f- a few friends. And do you remember what anybody, do you remember any of those conversations or like what they said when you told them? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't remember, but I do think that they did look at me kind of, um, <laughs> <laughs> skeptically and uh thought I'd lo- gone off the deep end. <laughs> oh. oh, but they could they were like your supervisor. They could tell there was something different about you. Oh, I think they could tell something was different about me. My mom and dad I lived with, of course. My sisters were both um distant. They weren't in my town or anything. So I probably told them on the telephone hmm. and and then a few friends. You were talking about how well, almost like you were wearing something different. There was a new hope for you. Do you remember right. how long did that last? Was that something that kind of buoyed you for days or weeks or months? Or um, I think it, it probably buoyed me for months, probably huh. months. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. This dream happened way back in 1983, a long time ago. Back then, Hallmark would give out little pocket calendars, and I circled April 18th on my calendar every year as if I would ever forget my angel visit. But that April 18th would come and go without anything happening, even remotely exciting. As the years passed, I still marked my calendar, but the excitement of anticipation had diminished. The year 1993 started with a relationship breakup and little thought of April 18th, but my calendar was still faithfully marked. My former boyfriend and I were taking up learning racquetball at the local YMCA. He was out of the picture now, but I liked playing, so I reserved a court for a February Sunday afternoon. 
I got there, and a group of men, some I recognized and some I didn't, were playing on the court. They gave up the court, and one of the men, a stranger to me, asked if someone was meeting me to play. I said no, and he volunteered to play. It was fun, so I made a reservation for the next Sunday afternoon. Lo and behold, the men were there again, and Mike asked if he could play with me again when their time was over. I said, sure. We played, and then we went to an ice cream shop and talked for two hours nonstop. (laughs) This relationship started off with a bang. We found ourselves spending most of our free time together. One Saturday morning, we were enjoying coffee at his house before we were going out to canvas our town with political brochures. There was a ballot proposal at the next election to change our form of municipal government. I showed Mike the day pack I had to carry the brochures. He started telling me about a trip he and his three sons had taken the previous summer and how they had packed a lunch in an old green backpack to eat lunch at the base of Mount Rushmore. I said when I was a teenager, I had spent two summers in Colorado working on a dude ranch, and I had an old Army surplus backpack. He went into the garage, then came back into the house carrying his backpack, but his face was ashen. I said, what's wrong? He turned the inside of the backpack toward me, and my maiden name was written in black marker across the top. He said, now I know I have to marry you. Apparently, my mother had tired of looking at that old thing and donated it to the church garage sale. And Mike loves garage sales. Wow. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> first, Our first sign, our first inkling. Uh-huh. <laughs> but the subject of marriage had come up before, but rather casually. One Saturday, shortly after the backpack thing, we visited a jewelry store at the mall and looked at wedding rings. I picked one out that I liked, but he didn't buy it. I figured we'd look around. There was no hurry. After all, he hadn't asked me to marry him. In these days, I helped teach the little ones in Sunday school, and once a month they sang in front of the congregation during the Sunday worship service. I would sit with them in the front pews before they sang, and then, after they sang, release them to go sit with their parents. Mike usually attended church with me, but this particular Sunday, he said he was going to be playing golf. It was a Sunday the kids were singing, so I marched the kids up to the front of the church to wait for our time to sing. I glanced to the back of the church and saw Mike come in and sit way at the back of the church. The kids sang, I released them to their parents, and I walked back and sat next to Mike. He seemed a little bit surprised at that. Our pastor, Dr. Breed, came down to the floor of the sanctuary in front of the altar table and asked, does anyone have a special request? (laughs) Mike stood up and moved to the front of the sanctuary. I didn't know what was going on. Then Mike turned toward the back, looked at me and said, I have a special request. Melody, I love you very much. And in front of God, your family and friends, will you marry me? I was, of course, crying. It could not have been pretty, but I squeaked out an enthusiastic yes. (laughs) I can't remember a thing Dr. Breed said during the rest of the service. Typically, at the end of the service, he would go down the center aisle and, and stand at the back of the sanctuary and greet the congregation. This particular Sunday, everybody made their way to me to see the ring and congratulate us. There were lots and lots of hugs. Still in shock, Mike and I met my mom and dad at their house before we went out to lunch together. My mom took me in the kitchen, grabbed my hands, and looked me in the eyes, asking, Do you know what day this is? You guessed it. Of course, it was April 18th, 1993. But I didn't realize it. I'd anticipated this date being special for years, but the date just slipped past me after nine years of nothing. Then mom asked me if Mike knew about April 18th. I said, no, I haven't ever told him about the dream. My mom said, Mike came over earlier this week and asked dad and I if he could have your hand in marriage. And as soon as he left, we looked at the calendar. We knew he was going to ask you on April 18th. Later, it was so fun to share the dream with Mike. He had no idea. Wow. 
<laughs> now we've been married for over 30 years, and whenever there has been a valley in our relationship, I, for one, remember our marriage was ordained by God. Wow. That angel dream is still a sweet, sweet blessing, even though I had to wait 10 years for it to come to pass. I still have my Hallmark calendar for 1993, and we celebrate our wedding anniversaries on July 3rd, and we also celebrate April 18th every year. And what this teaches me is that God is a promise keeper, and He is faithful. Wow. Yeah, what did that do to your faith? Nine years. Tell me about your faith in those nine (laughs) years of waiting. What was that like? Um. You know, my I, I was always faithful. I was always in a church. I moved uh, probably four or five times in different parts of the country. I even lived overseas for a time. And I, um, except when I was overseas, I was always in a congregation. So God's always been in my life. But I think I put him on a shelf like so many people. They get busy. They get into their um, their 20s and and uh, maybe 30s, and don't don't think God's relevant, unfortunately, but boy, he is relevant. <laughs> and, and this story I hold on to, this is, this is one of the rocks I hold on to in my life, and I know God's always there, always there. That's such an encouraging story, because I think uh, sometimes we relegate God to this, like he never does this kind of supernatural thing. I mean, that's pretty right. supernatural, even though it was 10 years in the waiting. Right, right. He had his hands in it all the way. Mm-hmm. Just shows goes to show he has his hands in your life all the way through your life. Yeah. And how and gracious, we, how gracious yeah. of him to give you something to hang on to, knowing oh. it was going to be a bit of a long stretch. But at that point when you were so low. Right. I needed that. <laughs> yeah. He sent me a life line Mm -hmm. at that time. Yes. I bet there are people listening who feel lonely and feel so discouraged in the waiting process. Do you have any, any, and they don't have a dream or a date on a calendar, but do you have any words for them? (laughs) Oh, I just say, reach out to God and he is faithful to deliver and uh, just open your heart up to him because he loves you and he wants you to be happy. He wants us to be blessed. And maybe a blessing isn't necessarily a husband for everybody, but, um, but he knows what we need more, more than we do. (laughs) Our next story is from Mary Potter Kenyon, grief counselor and author. It's one that we recently shared on our podcast called Wow God Stories. It's hosted by my dear friend, Lisa Williams. It's a compilation of short stories that capture amazing moments with our God. If you haven't already, look for Wow God Stories in your favorite podcast app and subscribe to it so you can hear more powerful God stories every other Wednesday. Here's Mary's story. My name is Mary Potter Kenyon. I'm married to Nick Portson and we live in Dubuque, Iowa. My mother died on my 51st birthday in 2010. And I believe that is where my faith journey began because after her death and the way I saw her face, certain death was with faith. She left, I believe, a gift for me in her faith, a legacy of faith and a legacy of creativity because she was such a creative woman. And I wanted to be more like her. And I was a pretty isolated mom at home of eight kids. And so I kind of pretended I was my mother when I started doing a little bit of workshops and writing for the newspaper. The grief journey was one of faith for me also because I was open to God after her death. And 17 months after my mother's death, I also lost a spouse. But because I had started opening myself up to God, God had sent people in my life that were an example of faith like she was. So God worked in me, and he brought me a mentor who asked me to write some devotions for a grief Bible at that time. And I just said yes, because I thought, now I have to figure it out. I have to figure out how to find answers in the Bible. And so here I was, I had lost a husband, I had lost a mother, and I had a grandson fighting cancer, which would turn out to be a terminal diagnosis. In July of 2018, on the way to work, I heard a very distinct pray for him. It was, it was a very strong um, voice, if you want to call it a voice, but it was more of a just a knowing 
pray for him. It was urgent. It was an urgent request. If I had not learned to listen to God, I would never have paid attention to this. And even then, with all he had shown me, even then I resisted because pray for who is what I said. Pray for who? Your future husband. And I resisted that voice for about 24 hours. I kept feeling and hearing, pray for him. It was just this urgency. And I, I waited, and it wasn't going to go away. I knew it wasn't going to go away. So I had started journaling after my husband died in 2012. And so I sat down the next morning, and I not only prayed for this future husband, but I wrote down that prayer. And as soon as I prayed, then that urgency left me, and I didn't hear anything else for another month, month and a half. And again, that urgent prayer pray for him. And this time I knew to obey and I immediately obeyed. Well, as we all know, COVID hit and the pandemic and I was working in 2020 and I was sent home. So two years had already gone by and I was starting to wonder, (laughs) had I really heard that voice? Had I really heard that urgent request to pray for my future husband? I think it about did me in to be so alone during that time. My youngest was 16 at the time. She was, of all my eight children, she was the one who didn't talk to me much. She never said, I love you. I would say goodnight, and she'd go, "Mm." you know, it was just like, so it was a very lonely time. There was no human touch. There was no, I was working from home. And I thought then, you know, I, I was probably imagining that. And by the next year, 2021, I was back at work and I was seeing people again, but that, that loneliness, I mean, I would, at night, it would just hit that loneliness. I, and I would think, you know, God, where is this man you promised me in 2018? And did I really trust you? Did I really trust God enough to believe there was a man that he was asking me to pray for? And I, I will tell you, three years had gone by and I was starting to wonder and I was thinking, well, maybe I have to do something to meet this person. And so my son had met somebody on a dating site and they were a nice person. I thought, well, maybe I'll just put my toe into the the dating world. So I signed up on a a Christian dating site and um, lo and behold, somebody reached out to me who said, it looks like you have what I want. I am seeking a relationship with God. And so I was willing to open my heart. It's a heart that I had asked God to protect. And I literally did that after my husband died in 2012. I had asked God, please protect my heart, because I knew people made bad decisions when their heart was not protected. So I opened up my heart, I opened up my mind, and I connected with this person. And the first day we met, we saw each other for two hours, and I tell you, we were saying things that we'd never said to anybody. I don't know how. We felt so comfortable with each other unless God was in it. And before our next date, I heard clearly again, you need to pray with this man. And I thought, what is it going to be like on our second date when I tell him that we need to pray together? If he says no, and I sure liked this man, if he says no, I got to say goodbye. And I knew that. I knew that with my whole heart because I had a relationship with God by then. And so at the beginning of that second date, I said, uh, we need to pray together. And he said, absolutely. And he took hold of my hands, and that was the first time we ever held hands. We prayed together, and that date lasted for nine hours. And I knew this man's wife had died in 2018. Could that be the man that God had told me to pray for? And I called a mentor, a Christian mentor, called him, and I said, I... I feel like this is a person. This is a man that God asked me to pray for. But but isn't this too soon? Because um, Nick Portson had called me that night after that nine-hour date and said, I think I'm falling in love with you. And I was scared. And my mentor said, Mary... Why are you even surprised? All that God has done for you in the last um, last years and the way he's done it in these amazing ways, asking you to do things you never imagined doing, and you step out in faith, and he says, this is exactly the way it happens. You need to trust your heart. And so I called him back, and I said, I think I'm falling in love with you, too, and I needed to read that prayer to him. I had not looked at it for all those years, and I read that prayer to him, and he said, do you think that man was me. And I said, I wouldn't be reading this to you if I didn't think it was you. 
we just knew somehow that God was in this and God had brought us together. And we both, um, all those fears, all those doubts um, just vanished. And we got married uh, six weeks later. And we have prayed together every single day. If we forget and we're away from each other, we call each other on the phone, we pray together. And we have seen something amazing. Between us, we had 75 years of marriage to our previous spouse between the two of us. And so you'd think we'd know all there is to know about marriage. But when God is in it, when God is at the center of it, when he's that third cord holding us together and prayer is in it, we have been in awe of how different marriage is when God is at the center of it. And only in the last couple months, uh, he was taking a nap and I was praying and I heard, go to his VA medical records. And I'm like, what? Go to his VA medical records because he has access to his VA medical records and I can get into them and look up that date. I went to his VA medical records and discovered here we'd been married for two years, discovered that on that day that God had been so urgently asking me to pray for him, on that date he had fallen and he had ended up in the emergency room in horrible pain. And so I was sitting there with tears pointing to my face because I was thinking, not only was this man in horrible emotional pain, but this man was in terrible physical pain on that date that God asked me to urgently pray for this man, my future husband. Well, I was in my early 30s, which doesn't seem that old now, but at the time it felt old. So many of my friends were married, they had kids, and that's what I wanted. It's what I longed for, but it, it just hadn't happened. Have you ever heard the phrase, always a bridesmaid, never a bride? I was a bridesmaid 10 times. I felt older and more single with every passing year. And I was also carrying around this sadness, like a, a suitcase full of discouragement. It was some seriously heavy baggage. And I felt like I was dragging it with me everywhere I went. Now, on the positive side, that discouragement was great motivation for me. It caused me to lean on God in a way that I never had before. And I think he used that season to help me learn about Matthew 6, 33, it's a, a verse that says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these other things will be taken care of. That's my paraphrase of it. Jesus was talking about how in that time, people were worried about what they were going to drink, what they were going to eat, what they were going to wear. He said, seek after God, and he'll take care of all the rest of it. And that season really transformed my life. Almost every area of my life got so much better when I shifted God to being my first priority. Now, I didn't do it perfectly, but... I made that my aim, but I still had that nagging thought that, that always seemed to be in the back of my mind. Am I ever going to get married? Well, I finally got to a place where I was ready to set that suitcase down. I felt like too much of my mental energy was focused on that question. Am I ever going to get married? And there came a day when I was ready to pack that away and move on with God's plans for my life, even if it meant I was going to be single. I, I was just on this particular day, I was out on a walk. That's where I often talk and I listen to God. And on this day, I just had this, I don't know what to call it, a strange confidence that I could ask God and he would tell me if marriage was not in his plan for me. I was ready to hear it. So I don't know where the boldness came from that I believed I could ask. And so I did. I just, I said something along the lines of, Lord, you know the plans you have for me. God, do your plans include marriage? Now, I have never in my life heard God audibly, but that day, that day, I don't know any other way to say it than this. He said, yes. When I said, God, do your plans include marriage? He said, yes. He spoke to me. I really believe that. It was a voice that I heard inside my head, but it was so loud, it reverberated. That's the only way I can describe it. It shocked me that I got a response so much so that I literally stopped in my tracks and I said out loud, you said yes. <laughs> he said yes. I couldn't believe it. Now, he didn't say who I was going to marry. He didn't say when, but it was clearly yes. And I knew that someday I was going to get married. I was so elated, I skipped home. Now, it took me about 10 minutes to get home. And by the time I was there, I was already second guessing. I knew how badly I wanted his answer to be yes. So what if somehow I made that up? You know how sometimes you just have this gut to the best of my ability to know, 
I knew I hadn't made it up. It was about six months later, I'll cut to the chase. I was out walking on that very same path through the same park. This time I was walking with a friend. He had called and he had asked if we could go for a walk and if we could talk about something. And on that walk, he asked if I would consider, if I would pray about going on a date with him. And it was about a year after that, that we were on that same path in that same park. And we sat down on a park bench and he proposed. And that was 20 years ago. That was three daughters ago. I love our story today. Waiting is hard. I know that firsthand. I I don't know what you might be waiting on today. Maybe it's a job or a spouse or a child or a dream. There's no magic formula. I don't have that. The only words of wisdom I can share, it comes back to that verse, Matthew 6, 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added. It's not a guarantee of marriage or kids or, or any particular thing that your heart might be longing for. But here's what I've found. When I shifted my gaze to Jesus, when I shifted the weight of, of my hopes and my dreams to him, and I asked him to help me trust him, whatever he brought my way, he honored that. I think when we surrender our hopes to Jesus, that's when he gives us the best life. And sometimes it includes the things that we're longing for. Sometimes it includes the things that we're dreaming of. And if you're waiting today, waiting on love, waiting on fill in the blank, seek after him first. I think it's the best way to wait. Thanks so much for listening to these stories today. I hope they've been an encouragement to you. I would love to hear your God story. Here's a simple way you can share it with me. Head to the Unfolding Podcast page on our podcast network website. It's wowgod.com. Look for the Unfolding page. You'll see a green microphone button. All you have to do is click that and you can record your story and send it to me. I would love to hear your story. Hey, if you love this podcast, would you help us spread the word by writing a kind review in your podcast app? We love to read your encouraging words, and it just might encourage somebody who's scrolling through podcasts to give this one a try. And we might even share your words in a future episode. Hey, if you'd like to help this kind of inspiring storytelling grow, you can support the Wow God Podcast Network. You help us create podcasts where every story gives listeners a chance to say, Wow God. You can make a monthly gift of $40 or a gift of any size at wowgod.com. Thanks to the unfolding team, Lindsay Caparoon, Michael Shermack, our amazing producer and network director, Jason Rakow. Special thanks to David A. Dean for helping to record Mary Potter Kenyon's story. The Unfolding is a Wow God production, a ministry of the University of Northwestern St. Paul. Discover more at wowgod.com. We'll be back next week with another page of The Unfolding.